Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village, calling the twelve to him. He sent them out two by two and gave them authority over evil spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra tunic. And whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and appointed uh, and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. I'm a bit disorganised this morning. There's one more song. <laughs> and then Peter will come. We're going to sing A Love That's Never Failing. Let mercy fall on me, Saviour. He can move the mountains. just had a little chuckle to myself then and that uh, 
shake the dust off your feet became a reality. When I saw on Peter Shearer at the back of his heels all the grass from our lawn, <laughs> I could tell what he'd been doing. So, thank you, Peter. And say, shake the lawn off your feet. It's just the dust. <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. It's, uh, it's good to see you. Who knows what's going to happen tomorrow? Tomorrow will be Monday. It's exactly right. I expect that I'll get up at 7 o'clock, have a shower, eat some breakfast, read my Bible go to my office and prepare a sermon. At the end of the day, I'll go home, have tea, spend an enjoyable evening with Karen, and go to bed. That's what I expect. But there's room for much to change, and that's okay. You just sort of go with the flow. But what could happen? Now, when I ask that question and I'm going to ask it, and hopefully you will will reply, what could happen tomorrow, that question is not an out-of-the-world reality in terms of fantasy or wild imagination. But knowing that we live in this fallen world and no one is perfect, etc., what could happen to you and me tomorrow? We could go home, which means, she's talking about going home to heaven, by the way, What else could happen? Have to go and babysit. Have to go and babysit. Oh, that would be a shame, wouldn't it? I mean, fancy looking after grandchildren. I mean, it's just... In fact, in fact when Karen does that on a Wednesday, she's quite exhausted on the Wednesday, <laughs> Wednesday night. So they do exhaust you a bit, don't they? What else could happen tomorrow? You could fall over. You could fall over. And if you fall over, what could happen? You could break something. You could skin your knee. You could die, go in a hospital, you know, get TB, need a booster shot, and then your arm explodes because it's gone. I mean, we've got to keep that out of the realm of fantasy, don't we? That's right. I mean, anything could happen tomorrow, couldn't it? Many years ago now, I knew a man who was a PE teacher at school. He used to ride his push bike to school uh, every day. He was a fit young man, or a young man, he's probably in his either 50-ish, give or take a few years, I don't know exactly. He was old to me because I was in my 20s, but anyway. um, (laughs) He fell off his bike going to school because he had a heart attack. Totally unexpected, totally out of the blue. He um, recovered quite quickly because he was fit, but, you know, you never know what's going to happen. The Delta variant of the COVID-19 is in New South Wales. Will, it be, will we be surprised when it reaches South Australia and we go into our own lockdown? So hopefully we're not going to be surprised by that. Some people will be surprised, but what we need to know is that we do live in a sin-filled world and because of human sinful nature is as it is, anything can happen tomorrow. Accidents, natural disasters, when you look from a worldwide, but anything really can happen. When we add to that the promise that Jesus will return soon, we have an urgency to life that says, don't put off tomorrow what you can do today. That statement can be seen in a positive or a negative way. It's negative when we have an urgency to do something that doesn't really matter. Now, I realise that that is a very subjective statement because what ha- matters to me doesn't have matter to you and, and the opposite uh, way around. But what I mean by that is that a lot of what we do has temporal or just today significance as opposed to anything that's really eternal. For example, <coughs> Karen and I have been talking about getting a new TV. The old one worked fine, but... There are some things that... So one day, two weeks ago, I said to Karen, do you want to get a new TV? So I did some research on Google. Isn't Google wonderful? 
and said to Karen, what are you doing this afternoon? Want to go buy a new TV? Karen was happy and now was the time to do it. Now, how important was it that we get a new TV and we get it now? <laughs> watch the Olympics. Well, we didn't watch much of the Olympics, but I mean, in the scheme of things, how important was it? It's a, it's a pretty low importance, isn't it? It's only a TV. And we had one there that, that worked and was okay. Just I know, I assume all of us can think of things that are important to us. But if we allow ourselves to really stop and think about it, how important are they? When we look at the person of Jesus, now this is another question that I'd like you to answer out loud. Why did Jesus come to earth as a baby 2,000 or so years ago? Okay, to save mankind. That fulfilled a promise. Okay, to reveal the kingdom of God to us through words and, and, and actions. Now, there are many good and right answers to that question. The, the answer that I want to um, enlarge on a bit is the one that uh, Peter gave. Jesus came to fulfill God's promise that he gave to us when he was disciplining or punishing Adam and Eve and the devil. In Genesis 3.14, God is speaking to the devil and he hands out his punishment or discipline to the devil. And then in verse 15, he says this. I will put en enmity between you and the woman, between the devil and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He will bruise your head and you will bruise your heel. Now the bruising of a head is a death sentence. The bruising of the heel is very painful. Who knows what it's like to walk with a bruised heel? It's not very nice. You sort of make up for it and your whole body feels it. But this promise was given by God and we know that God never breaks a promise. 2,000 years or so ago, God fulfilled his promise when he sent Jesus. Now the time is right, says God, and the Virgin Mary gave birth to Jesus. With the coming of Jesus came a new age, a new covenantal period, and a new and greater sense of urgency. One of the great things about the book of Mark is not that it's the shortest book and you can read it quickly, but as we read it, we get a great sense of urgency. Mark doesn't take much time to talk about the birth of Jesus, unlike Matthew and, and Luke. Jesus is on the scene. He's there, ready to go. A few verses on, we find Jesus' baptism, and then Jesus is in the wilderness being tempted by Satan. Two verses later, Jesus is proclaiming his message and calling his disciples. So much has happened, and we're only halfway through chapter 1. There's a strong sense of urgency to Mark's gospel that comes out again in our passage this morning. Jesus has just done some mighty healings in chapter 5, and in the beginning of chapter 6, we have that he is rejected in his hometown. He goes to the synagogue and the people reject him. So what does he do? He gathers his 12 disciples around him and sends them out two by two, giving them authority over the unclean spirits. Now this is reasonably early on in Jesus' ministry. And what has his disciples learnt so far? Not much. I think they, learnt, um, they would have been with Jesus as he taught in the synagogues. When Jesus taught the Nazarenes in the synagogues, in their synagogues, the disciples would have been just as amazed as his teaching 
as the people of Nazareth would have been. The difference would have been, instead of rejecting him, they listened, they learnt, and they continued to follow. How long would they have spent with Jesus by now? We're not sure exactly. But it wouldn't have been years of seminary training with exams, essays, and tutorials that needed to be passed. As good Jews, they would have had the normal Jewish upbringing in their scriptures, the Genesis, the Exodus, the Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the writings and the prophets, etc. They would have done all of their studies in, in all, of, all of that. And so they wouldn't have been ignorant. But when it came to Jesus... They wouldn't have been with him a long time and they were still learning and Jesus sends them out. There's a sense of urgency here. Go, says Jesus. I will give you authority over unclean spirits so you can drive out demons and heal people, but go. Tell people about me so that people can repent. I don't know how long they were gone, but look at how they went. They took no food, no bag, no man money, just one pair of sandals, and no change of clothes. Now, how long would it take them to be ready? Now, remember, these are men, not women. <laughs> <laughs> how long would it take them to be ready no time I don't think they would have had this staff ready go says, says Jesus what more did they need there's a sense of urgency here in the sending out go says Jesus there's no time to waste catastrophe is about to come now I've put the word catastrophe in here but let me, let's stick with that word, so humor me for just for a little while. What catastrophe is about to come? Judgment? That's not what I'm thinking about. Earlier I asked the question, why did Jesus come? And a good answer for that is, which someone didn't use the exact words, but the implication is theirs. Jesus came to die. Isn't the death of Jesus a catastrophe? Now you may say to me, no, it isn't a catastrophe, it's the salvation of the world. And that's true, but look at it from God the Father's perspective. The Father's only Son is about to die. Would you call the death of your only son a catastrophe? Many years before, uh, uh, Abraham was told by God to sacrifice his only son and he obediently set out to do it. Wouldn't that have been a catastrophic time for Abraham? Imagine the relief for Abraham and Isaac when God told him to stop. And do we honestly think that Abraham and Isaac never ever recalled that catastrophic moment? That moment in Abraham and Isaac's life also looked forward to the, time, the day when the Heavenly Father allowed his son to be killed. The catastrophe of that moment is never lost. Jesus' death was and still is the greatest catastrophe of the world and the pivotal point of all history. It was the moment the world moved from slavery to freedom, from law to grace, from old covenant to new covenant. To make the move from slavery to freedom, all that is needed is faith in the once dead, now resurrected Lord Jesus Christ, and that is available to everyone. Once we have faith, it is hard to see the death of Jesus as a catastrophe because we now have life and life of thought in all its fullness. But for God the Father, it would have been a catastrophic time, but a time he was willing to orchestrate 
and endure such is his love for us. So Jesus sends out the twelve with a sense of urgency. His death is approaching soon. But Jesus didn't send them out empty-handed. He gave them authority over unclean spirits and they came back on top of the world because they had seen people healed, they had cast out demons. We too are sent into our world to share Jesus with those around us and he doesn't send us out empty-handed either. What has God given to us as we go out into the world to be God's people, to share Jesus with others? What has God given us? That's my first point. (laughs) He's given us the Holy Spirit. In John chapters 14 to 17, it's a great passage of of Jesus talking but he says in chapter 14 verse 26 and 27 but the helper the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you peace I leave with you my peace I give to you not as the world gives do I give to you let not your hearts be troubled neither let them be afraid and Matthew 28 18 to 20 is another great passage where it says to us that we don't go alone. God is with us. We not, may not know what to say, but when the moment comes, he will give us words to say. We may feel as if we bumble along, but God, God is able to use our weakness to display his strength. We need to go but we don't go alone. We have the Holy Spirit, God himself with us. What else does God give us? The word of God, yes. We go with his word, preferably with our word, the word in our hearts, because it's easy to recall when we have memory verses or words in our hearts rather than, oh, I've got to, hang on a tick, let me just open up the book. But we go with his word, the word of God. What else does he give us? The authority of his name that goes with the Holy Spirit. Yes. There's one, th- one, two, two very important things that I want to mention in terms of we don't go alone. He gives us our story. God has been active in our lives ever since we said yes and allowed him to take control. Through our story, God can use our story to show himself to others and in fact God can reach certain people with your story that no other story will reach I'm not quite sure if I quite said that right but our story is important as we go into the world with others the other thing I want to mention is he gives us one another we are not alone in the sense that God is with us but we are also not alone in the sense that we go into this world as family We go with one another. One of the reasons for our existence is that we are to encourage one another, support one another, exhort one another. We are to be family as we go into the world. We may feel a failure at times, but whether we feel a failure or a success, we support one another. We encourage one another. And we know that if or when we feel a failure, we also know that God is great enough to use our faith. In our passage this morning, there's a great sense of urgency because the death of Jesus is just around the corner. The fulfillment of God's promise has happened. Jesus has come. He was preaching the message of the kingdom of God to the Jews and to the rest of the world and his death was just around the corner. The urgency is even greater today because all that is left is for Jesus to return. And after Jesus returns, there will be no more opportunity for people to repent. The urgency is even greater today than in Jesus' day because Jesus has died and risen again and only his return is still to come. 
It is my prayer that in our heart of hearts, we are graciously driven by a sense of godly urgency. People need to hear God's good news. And as they hear, they need to be given opportunity to respond, to repent. May we be used by God to be his mouthpiece to this world in which we live. Amen. We're going to sing our last song, Salvation Belongs to Our God.